Josh Adler. I'm the founder of Source Water, Inc. Source Water is based here in Houston, Texas, and I'll be telling you something about the company as we uh, move on the program. I want to start, though, with some questions, which are the questions that uh, we often ask and are often asked. Can we answer these questions, and would they be useful for your business? And these are the questions that drive our business and our development. What if you could see where every drop of produced water is, was, and will be on the surface and in the subsurface? What would that do for your business, depending on what kind of business you're in? And I'm interested, actually, uh, for those, uh, those of you out there, what kind of businesses are you here from? Who here is from an oil field services company? Mostly. Uh, and are these all oil field service companies that deal with water management in some capacity? And of course, that's why you're here. So, would it be useful to know where all the water is and where it's going? Maybe you can figure out which operators have a lot of water who could use your service. Or maybe they're doing business with one of your competitors right now. And you could see that, and you could offer them a better deal or a more convenient location or a better quality. You could see among your competitors who your clients are, where are those relationships. What if you could see where new drilling and completions and disposals will go in the future, on the surface and below the surface? Are any of you in saltwater disposal? Do you own or operate saltwater disposals? How many of you own or operate at least one saltwater disposal, but you're a service company or an operator? You do. Yeah. So if you knew where the new drilling and completions would be in the future, would that help you figure out where to put the next disposal? And if you knew where other disposals were going, that would tell you something about where your competitor's going and whether maybe you want to get there first or maybe you don't want to go there at all. Or if you're an operator, knowing where those disposals are ejecting might tell you something about where you should be concerned about subsurface cross communication, overpressuring of formations, or tell you something about how to design your drilling program. And what if you could see exactly where to put new water infrastructure on the surface and under it? That would be pretty helpful if you're an operator who's building new disposal capacity, if you're a service company that's drilling new disposal wells. Where should you land them in the subsurface? Where is there going to be available pressure and volume capacity under the ground? Where should you put that disposal on the ground? Where should you run those water pipelines so that you can maximize the utilization or return on investment on that infrastructure? These are the kinds of questions that we're trying to answer at Source One. And what we've done at our company is over the last almost six years, invest in new data gathering technologies and new data science methods to be able to answer exactly those questions for our clients. And so today, I'm going to tell you about how big data, artificial intelligence, and spy satellites are transforming oil field water management and what we're doing to bring those new technologies into our industry to answer your business questions to help you plan and manage your businesses better in the oil field water space. First thing I want to tell you about is Source Water's mission, which is to show where all oil field water is, was, and will be on the surface and under it. We're not just looking at the relationships between each producing oil and gas well, the water wells and frack pits that supply it, and the salt water disposal wells and recycling facilities where those producing leases send their water. We're also looking in that z-axis, the subsurface, where is that water coming up from in the producing water formation or in the groundwater aquifer, and where is that salt water being sent down into, or where it should it be sent down into, in the 47 subsurface formations in the Permian Basin where you can inject salt water. Most people think there's two or three, but there's 47. With those insights, we then help our clients make the best water business investment and management decisions. That's Source Water's mission. Show you where all the water is, where it's coming from and going to, 
and then help you make better business decisions with those insights. Whether that's because you're an oil field service company trying to figure out where to invest, who to target, where to do your business development, a water midstream company looking at where to put your disposals and where to put your pipelines to maximize that ROI and know how to price that capacity, or whether you're an operator trying to figure out how much disposal capacity you're going to need, how much water is going to come out of the ground from this drilling program, and how much you should be budgeting and planning for all of those decisions. So Source Water originally started out of the Energy Ventures program at MIT back in 2012. I was a Sloan Fellow there, got really interested in the unconventional energy industry and the growth in our industry. And in particular, my question was, basically, anything that gets this big, this fast, there are going to be tremendous entrepreneurial opportunities in that kind of space. If you think it grows that big, that fast, there's no way they don't do it, right? So whatever it is that's really new about unconventional energy versus conventional, that's where there's going to be the greatest opportunity to create new solutions and solve problems. And uh, what I learned in that time, as many of you knew then and certainly know now, is that the biggest thing that's really new about unconventional energy versus conventional is the water. For the first time with the rise of hydraulic fracturing, unconventional oil production in particular, starting in really 2009 in earnest, it's only been 10 years, which is pretty crazy. In the last 10 years, water sourcing, logistics, and disposal has become straight up volumetrically the primary activity of the onshore oil and gas activity. I mean, most of what happens out in the field is moving water around. If you're looking at volumes, right? It's 10 times as much as the oil that's getting moved around. And from an expenditure standpoint, if you're a permanent basin operator, you're probably spending more than half of your operating budget on water management activities. So this isn't just the biggest volume commodity in the oil and gas business. It's actually a majority of most companies' budgets if they're doing onshore unconventional. So our original idea for how to address this was to create a marketplace to make the best decisions about where to get water from and where to send it to. Uh, and we still have that marketplace. We have thousands of listings on it. We have something like one third of all the saltwater disposal capacity in the Permian Basin listed for sale on our marketplace at sourcewater.com. But we've evolved a lot over the last six years. We created a system called WaterMap, which shows all of the data, all the geospatial intelligence around where all the water assets are. And we also acquired and built out water asset intelligence, which shows the flow relationships between all of those water assets, by which I mean the pits, the wells, the disposals, the recycling facilities in Texas, New Mexico, North Dakota, Pennsylvania, we're always adding more geographic areas. We also more recently acquired the most popular oil field navigation app used by over 20,000 oil field workers to find well sites, find their jobs, called well site navigator. And we're incorporating those systems into what we're doing source water as well. Along the way, we acquired a lot of great clients and many more who aren't on this list. Uh, but I'm uh, pretty confident that we're the leading oil field water intelligence company. And we've got a lot of great clients who tested that. And we're based here in Houston, Texas. We've been growing a lot. We're up over 20 people now in our downtown Houston office, and probably going to be up to 30 by the end of this year. Some of you might have seen the news that we recently had a significant investment round uh, led by a number of uh, energy companies and family offices in the energy business. We're really excited about that, and that's given us the ability to invest a lot more in the people and technology and solutions that we're providing. So the first thing I want to talk about is the evolution of the water market in our industry, particularly in the Permian Basin, over the last 10 years. It's been an interesting time. Uh, many of you probably still remember that from about 2009 to 2014, oil prices were up around more or less $100 a barrel. We had this combination of very strong energy prices with the explosion of this new technology, unconventional energy development hydraulic fracture and horizontal drilling. And with the kinds of margins that were being generated by the companies in the business from 2009 to 2014, nobody was paying that much attention to what their cost structures were because it didn't really matter. They had huge margins, it was all blowing and going, and all of this water was getting moved around by truck. Nobody was too worried about where it was going as long as you were able to keep up. 
And in this time, we saw the development of more and more water disposal capacity in the basin. Today, there's over 3,000 saltwater disposal wells in the Permian Basin. And we've seen more and more water being produced from the existing stock and ever-growing number of producing oil and gas wells. And this chart shows approximately over the last 10 years how that amount of produced water disposed just keeps going up and up and up. We're up around probably 4 billion barrels of water being disposed of in the Permian Basin now. And that's only about one third of the actual water being produced from all the wells in the Permian Basin. Because about two thirds of water that's produced actually goes to EOR and injection water flooding. About one third goes to disposal. One of the interesting patterns here, of course, is the growth in saltwater disposal capacity. So just pick in a random county that's small enough to visualize. If you look at Loving County about 10 years ago, there were about 10 saltwater disposals in Loving County, middle of the Permian Basin. Today, there's more like 120, 130 disposals in Loving County, so a lot of them added. But what's really interesting is, you can see on this chart, the produced water flows and disposal keeps going up. The disposal capacity keeps going up. But if you look in a little more detail, even just in the past year, the average pressure utilization of those disposals, in this case, just Loving County, but the same pattern holds everywhere, the pressure utilization has gone up from 25% to about 45% in just a year. So in other words, we're having a lot of disposal capacity, but it's not keeping up with the amount of water that keeps growing and coming out of the ground. There is a shortfall in disposal capacity for the salt water produced from all these oil and gas wells. We're not keeping up, despite creating all of these new disposals. And the reason for it is the big secret. Here's a randomly chosen satellite image of an area just south of Odessa. And this is about three years ago. And then you look at it today. That's a couple months ago. If you look at the ground there, look at all those new well pads. Look at all the new frack pits and reserve pits that are in this same image in these two shots. There's an incredible amount of development happening out there. And all of this development is using, but even more it's producing, more and more water. So in the early days, we moved everything by truck. Trucks are great because it's basically all variable costs. You need a truck, you get a truck, you don't need a truck, you don't get a truck. Right? You're only spending for what you use. The problem is, trucks just aren't that big when it comes to the kind of water that we're producing here. And when you start getting into thousands and thousands of truckloads of water for each frack, and way more than that for the combination of the flow back and the produced water, you just can't make the numbers. It's not just not making the numbers work. You can't even fit those many trucks on the road. I mean, we have serious infrastructure constraints in all of the most advanced oil field regions. There's not enough road for those trucks. And you can't fit the water in those trucks. And the cost of moving the water is more than a dollar a barrel if you're putting it in a truck. So you're probably not getting away with less than a dollar fifty a barrel for hauling a disposal if your water touches the truck. It becomes a serious issue when you consider that the typical frack has gone from using 75,000 barrels of water injected, maybe 2010, to now using typically 500,000 barrels or more injected per frack in 2019. And most wells are now multi well pad drilling wells where you're actually lining up the water to stimulate a bunch of wells in series today, which means you're actually completing two or eight wells at a time, and all that water's got to be lined up up front. So you're actually talking about not going from 50 to 100,000 barrels of water, say, seven or eight years ago, to 500,000. It's more like you're going from 50 to 100,000 barrels of water to more like two, three, four million barrels of water for each completion program. It's a huge amount in, and an even greater proportion amount that's coming so what's happened in the industry? Everyone's moved to placing pipelines wherever they can. Water's getting moved in mostly by temporary pipeline or by transfer line, because it's a lot lower cost per barrel to move that water. And going out, we see the rise of the water ditching companies and operators wherever they can for placing trucks or pipes. And so what, what you saw happening here, particularly in the downturn, was companies, operators, 
that had capital budgets weren't making a great return on investment, investing those capital budgets in drill completions because the energy price was so far down. So what were they doing? They were trying to replace operating costs with capital costs. They were saying, we're spending a lot of money on hauling and disposing of water. In fact, it's a majority of our total operating budget during this time period where we're producing but not drilling as much. How do we get rid of that cost when you consider the coils only selling for $30, $40 a barrel? And the answer in most cases was, let's vertically integrate our water operations, replace these trucks with pipes, and then we're not paying for trucks anymore. And this is common in a lot of industries when you have this kind of cyclicality. I'd like to compare, for example, let's say, um, I'll just pick a random, not picking on Chevron, but let's say Chevron sends a lot of people to Midland every month to do work out here from Houston. They're spending a lot of money putting up people at the Doubletree Hotel in downtown Midland. And so if they were to look at that, they might say, some of the operations would say, we're spending a lot of operating money paying for hotel rooms in downtown Midland. Well, how do we cut that budget? I know. Let's build our own hotel, Chevron Hotel, and let's have our people stay there because then we don't have to pay all this money out to a third party. We're basically keeping the money inside the house. The problem with that is most of the time that hotel is pretty empty. And actually, it's not being run as efficiently and it's not really being marketed at all compared to you know, the courtyard or the double tree or a company that, you know, Hilton Garden, that's really, really good at filling hotels and running them very, very efficiently. And so at a certain point, when the business picks up again, what you see is the companies that invested in building that internal capacity using capital of investment have to sell it off in order to get their cash back and invest their investor cash in the real businesses that they're supposed to be in, which in this case is the drill bit, right? It's producing energy. And what's happened is when companies, and here's an example, do a company like Calcon, which happens to now be in the bankruptcy process, but here in 2017, they were promoting to their investors that they could build this great vertically integrated water infrastructure system. And so, in fact, in their investor report in 2018, they're putting out, you can see this chart in the upper right, that they were saving a ton of money on operating costs, moving and getting rid of their water. Because what were they doing? They were replacing an operating cost with a capital cost. And that doesn't get accounted for in the same place, and so it doesn't show up in the budget. Well, then what happens after that? This is a pattern that repeats over and over again. As the market starts picking up again, they realize they should sell that capital infrastructure to a third party who's actually in the business of keeping pipes full, or keeping hotels full, or keeping planes or buses full. It's always the same thing. You have a certain amount of fixed capacity in the short term, and then the whole business is keeping it full. And if you're one company that has water flows that are constantly going up and down, you're never able to fill your infrastructure by yourself. You've always either got too much or too little. So you sell to somebody who's able to rent those rooms every night is good at it. In this case, they sold their infrastructure to water bridge. So then what happens in the industry? We're seeing the same pattern that we saw in the rise of the gas, the natural gas midstream industry, in the crude oil midstream industry before that, which is that we now have these third-party midstream companies buying and building this water infrastructure to move around. And then they consolidate. So there, in this case, it was the Skeets infrastructure that they got acquired by NGL. And eventually, it's going to look just like this map, which is the natural gas pipeline infrastructure of the Permian Basin. Except there is no map like this for water because you don't have to report your water pipelines. So the Railroad Commission let you do oil and gas. So all of this seems like it should be a great opportunity in our industry. We know there's more and more water coming out of ground. We know that it's never going down. Right? The water to oil ratios only ever go up. And that's because these wells are designed to be really good at producing oil. And so they produce the oil first, and then there's less oil coming out, less pressure on that, but the water just keeps coming. Because the Permian Basin used to be the Permian Sea, and the oil is basically all the little guys that were loafing and swimming around in there that got compressed 100 million years ago, got turned back into their carbons. Except they were swimming in the water, and there's a lot more water down there than there were little guys swimming around in. And the water's still there. So the water comes up with every single hole we poke in the ground, and it doesn't stop. We just keep adding to that stock of wells that keep producing that water, bringing the Permian Sea back up to the ground. And so, yes, there's lots of water coming out of the ground, 
But that doesn't mean that you can just put a disposal or recycling facility anywhere in the Permian Basin or the Eagle Fur or the Scoop Stack, wherever you're going, and just have it fill up. Because there's a fundamental problem in this particular business that is quite unique, which is you have to match supply and demand not just across the industry, across the region, but at a micro level every single time. And so this whole business, of course, is matching supply and demand, right? It's renting hotel rooms, it's filling plane seats, it's filling trucks, it's filling pipes, it's filling disposal wells and treatment facilities. You got a certain amount of capacity, and the whole game is, how do you get up to that 99.9% utilization level for as much of the time as you possibly can? And so sometimes nobody shows up, and, you know, there's no water in the pool, and sometimes everybody shows up and you're filling up the jacuzzi with a whole bunch of people you've never met before. Because people are in Norway. So in this case, the demand is water production, right? It's water that needs to find a home. The supply is the capacity of water disposal and reuse opportunities in the market. And these should match up at some big level, more or less. The problem is that calculation is incredibly complex. It's almost unanswerable. Because unlike, say, the hotel business, where all the hotels are more or less the same, and the person who's staying in the hotel, they can go to any hotel in town, right? As long as you know where the two planes are going, you can get on any of those planes and any of those seats. That is not the case in the salt water disposal and recycling and reuse business. And there's a bunch of reasons for that. The first is the Permian Basin is huge, right? It's actually the size of the nine smallest US states, or put another way, it's the size of all six New England states put together, including Maine, which Maine is actually a decent sized state, but like the other ones. There's over 300,000 producing wells. So there's been over a million wells drilled. There's actually about 3 billion barrels of produced water being disposed of, probably closer to 12 billion being produced. There's over 8,000 oil and gas operators. Now, a lot of those are, you know, granted one or two pump jacks in the backyard. But there are an enormous number of companies that are producing water. There's over 3,000 saltwater disposals, and there's over 10,000 class two disposal and injection wells. And there's millions of relationships out there. But the Permian also has a Z dimension. It's not just X and Y laterally. The Permian is also very deep. In fact, we estimate that there are 47 different saltwater disposal formations in the subsurface of the Permian. And there's probably only three or four that anybody can really name. Everyone knows about the San Andreas. That's the shallow one in the Midland Basin that everybody's been using forever and is getting completely pressured up the pole. Everybody's heard about the Ellenberger, which is really deep and in some places is associated with seismicity if you're injecting under too much pressure, but has a lot of volume available down there because there aren't that many deep wells like that. Over on the Delaware Basin side, you got the Delaware Mountain Group, which is the more shallow side. And then you got the Devonia, which is real deep and real expensive. But there's actually over 40 other formations you could be injecting into if you knew exactly where they were where and what are the pressures and volumes available for those. And so we now have got a calculation that's in the X, the Y, and the Z. Not just where the water's going down, but where the water's coming up from. How do you know how much water's going to come out of that new well that's being drilled by the operator of the next piece over? It doesn't just depend on the X and Y laterally where they're drilling. It depends exactly where they're landing that well, what formation they're producing from, because that's what tells you the most about what the water flow and water to oil ratio are going to be. So you would have to know that. You'd have to know how deep exactly they're drilling, not just how deep, but how deep is the formation in that place that they're going to be tapping into, so that you know in X, Y, and Z how much water is going to come out of the ground. And then, if that wasn't complicated enough, you have to know the when. You have to know the T, the time. How much time will this water be needed if it's a reuse or recycling program? How, how long will this disposal last until the pressure's up? For how long will these wells be flowing back or producing? Along with the X, Y, and Z. It is an incredibly complex computation for which there is no simple or even a complex answer that can just give you the answer. It's always changing, it's very dynamic. And so the kinds of questions that we get at Source Water all the time, we get people calling us asking these kinds of questions. Where will the produced water come online? How much is going to come out of the ground? Who is going to be producing it? Where is their excess disposal capacity? And where are their shortages? 
relative to that water that's going to be coming out of the ground, or is coming out of the ground now. And not just in the X and Y, but in the Z. Right? Where should I land these disposal wells where I know I'm going to be able to put a lot of water for a long time? I certainly don't want to invest $10 million in building a disposal and then find out that the formation that I'm ejecting into is overpressure and filling up. Where are operators sending that water now? So I know if there's a better opportunity for me to offer. What are the market prices for disposal in my area of interest? Whether that's because I'm an operator trying to do a budget plan, or because I'm a water industry or disposal company trying to figure out what's my return on investment going to be if I put 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 million dollars into building disposal and pipeline infrastructure in this area. Well, I need to know not just how much water is going to fill up that system and when. I need to know how much are people going to be willing to pay me for each barrel of water that goes in my system to be able to calculate my returns and underwrite this and get investors for that project. So now I'm going to talk about what kinds of data and tools and data science we've been developing in order to answer those kinds of questions. So the first thing to understand about source water is we are part a data engineering, data gathering organization. And we gather data from more kinds of sources than I think any other company in this industry. I would just mean the few other companies that do anything involving water intelligence gathering. I mean in terms of companies that are gathering market intelligence relating in any way to upstream energy. So we gather data from government records like the Railroad Commission and the New Mexico Office of State Engineer and many other states and federal agencies, which I'll talk more about. And a lot of companies do that. I mean, if you look at the market intelligence offerings in the oil and gas industry, pretty much every company out there does essentially the same thing. They're gathering government data, they're chewing it up a little bit, maybe not at all, maybe a little more, and they're throwing it on a map. We're throwing lots of dots on a map. We do that. We think we do it better. But we do a lot more as well. We gather insights from our online marketplace, which is the only source in the upstream industry for real commodity price data on the supply chain side. We conduct ongoing market research, talking to real people, asking them questions to verify what we're learning from the other sources and tell us what's coming down the line and actually gather human intelligence. And as I'll talk more about, we're doing some very new things using technologies such as satellite imagery analysis and computer vision and machine learning to see what's happening on the ground before it ever shows up in the government records, before anybody hears about it. And we're doing more with mobile sensors and GPS tracking to understand what's happening in the supply chain in real time. And we're getting more and more into advanced new science. So the first data gathering area I'll talk about is our marketplace listings which are unique in that they are real prices for real people. And so we have thousands of users who created listings of water and disposal capacity for sale on our marketplace. And you get a result that looks something like this. It looks like Airbnb or Elf or Expedia, your typical online marketplace, except in this case, it's water and disposal capacity for sale. And this passes through to our intelligence service that tells us and allows us to map what are the real world prices of water and disposal and recycling in the areas where our clients are interested. Same thing on the disposal side. And these prices are all over the place. Here's an aggregation of prices just by county, but you can see that they vary a lot, and if we dug into this in more detail, you would see that there's quite a large range within each county for the high and the low. There's a way bigger variation both in water pricing and disposal pricing than anybody realizes from just their own perspective. It used to be that we asked somebody in the middle, what's water cost? They tell us, oh, 50 cents a barrel, everybody knows that. And then as we started doing more and more transactions, we saw, well, no, it actually goes from basically two cents a barrel up to a dollar a barrel, even within one county. In some places, we've seen as high as $3 a barrel. And some people just made really bad deals and got themselves locked into basically free water on you know, their surface lease. So there's a huge range, and the same thing's true on disposal. You'll see it running from 15 cents a barrel up to 85 cents, 90 cents a barrel. In some places, New Mexico could be over a dollar. There are enormous ranges, not just within the major basin regions, but sometimes within direct neighbors. Somebody's charging 30 cents, the guy next door charges 60 cents. Why? Eh, just what I charge. And the people who are sending the business to one and the other don't know about the other one. 
they're doing, they can say half off by going one mile over. We also gather the government records. We don't just collect them, though, and I think it's a really important distinction. We don't just gather the Railroad Commission data and the Texas Water Development Board data, which I have to say, we are the only company that gathers oil field water data and then actually applies modern data science and data engineering methods to quality assure that data, which is really important because the quality of the data is really bad. So the most important of the major Texas data sources for water logistics and water flows is the P18 skin well report. So let me ask you, who in this room has heard of the P18 skin well report before? I know Rick has. <laughs> we got a few. It's get, the word is getting out. We're up to about half. Usually even in water management conferences, two people raise their hand. So the P18 skin well report was created a long time ago to help the state of Texas figure out where to attribute oil skimmed from saltwater disposal so they know which lease it's coming from and where the royalties are supposed to go and who's supposed to get taxed. It was never intended to track water, but it just so happens that every commercial saltwater disposal has to file it and they have to say on it not just how much skim oil they got, but how much water they got from each lease. And so what we're able to do is tie those individual listings, which in some cases are hundreds of lines on just one month report for each of about 2,500 disposers in Texas. We're able to tie those back to the original leases that they came from and generate live charts like this that show the flow and volume relationships between every producing oil and gas lease and exactly which saltwater disposal or disposals that lease is sending their water and how much water is being sent. And so that turns out to be really valuable information, particularly if you are in the saltwater disposal, reuse, recycling, or logistics business. Because what it's basically telling you is, it's telling you the vendor lists ranked by amount of business and more or less telling you the value of that business for every single operator. And it's showing you the customer list for every single one of your disposal competitors. For every disposal well, it's showing you exactly who is sending them water and how much from where. And so that turns out to be really, really useful if you're trying to figure out, can I place a disposal or do I have a disposal that is closer to that operator who's been producing a lot of water than the place where they're sending the water now? Because if I can put a disposal closer to them, I can save them a lot of money and they're probably going to go with me instead of my competitor. Or maybe that operator is sending water right past you. And you can go to and say, hey, you know, you can save a lot of money driving or piping 10, 20, 30 miles shorter. We also track the H10 injection volumes, which are once per year reports that show both pressure and volumes injected, not just for the commercial disposal wells, but for every injection well in Texas. This becomes important for assessing what's happening with the pressures and volumes, not just in individual wells, but within a sub-region where you want to know what's happening with capacity and trends in that market. Now, as I mentioned before, what we are really investing in with the government data isn't just the gathering of the data better and better, although we do invest a lot in that. For example, with respect to the P18 skim oil reports, those reports are supposed to be filed each month, and they usually get released on about a three-month lag from the railroad commission. But actually, there's not really any enforcement to filing these on time. And so what we do is every single day, we go back through the last two full years of every single P18 form that's been filed. And we look to see, did any new ones show up today at any time from the last two years? And it happens all the time. And so we see a form show up from six months ago, 12 months ago, 18 months ago, that wasn't there yesterday. And we make sure to go back and update all of our data and all of our analytics and insights by using that system. No one else does that. We do a lot more with these quality assurance programs as well. And here's an interesting chart if you look at the uh, map we have on the board now. So it turns out that there are a huge number of errors in the regulatory filings for saltwater disposal wells in Texas and in other states too. A lot of times there's a blank where there should be a number, but that doesn't mean it's
at zero. Sometimes somebody leaves out a decimal point, which means it's at 100 times what it should be, or 10 times what it should be. Or somebody just writes in an illegible way, and so, you know, that S looks like a five, or five looks like an S, or the zero looks like eight or a six, or whatever it is. We create automated systems that identify those errors and variations and normalize them. And what we find is that, for example, in Andrews County, more than 40% of the saltwater disposals have false and misleading information in the regulatory data that we're able to normalize out. And if you were just taking that data straight from the Railroad Commission or straight from any other source of oil field water intelligence that exists today in the market, you would be getting 40% wrong information in Andrews County. In most of these other counties, the numbers are also very significant. 10 to 20%, 20 to 30% long information is the norm. And so here's an example of a case like that. Here's a, a Culberson County disposal well, where over the last 20 years, there just happened to be one number, one number, that was off by a factor of 7,000. And if you could read this up close, you'd see it happened in something like 1992. But because there was one number about the volume of actually pressure being ejected into the well, if you just took the raw data and you know, created a trend line out of it and looked at an average, you would be wrong on the actual average pressure of that well by 22% because one data point in the last 20 years was off by a massive amount. Those types of huge outliers happen all the time, and so we find those we normalize them. Another area that we gather is all the TextNet and USGS seismic data, because I'm sure as everybody in this room has heard, seismicity is a big concern around disposal well planning and getting new drilling permits. And so we show you where all the seismic activity is and allow you to see whether that is going to impact your new disposal permit or whether as an operator you should be concerned about seismicity, where you are sending your water now, maybe you should be sending it somewhere we also map every single surface owner in the states of Texas and New Mexico, because that's the most important thing you need to know when you're trying to figure out and negotiate your rights of way for your transfer lines and for your pipelines. You have to do all the work on the surface, it's not just the mineral owners. And we allow you to map out and draw your lines and see who you're crossing and who you need to talk to and we give you your contact information. We also call all those surface owners and ask them, hey, we saw a frack pit on your property. Whose frack pit is that? What operators is it serving? How much water is in there? We also gather all of the oil and gas permit and production data, as well as freshwater well data, <laughs> in addition to the disposal well and water production data. Why do we do that? Basically because if you have oil field water data without having oil and gas data, you're basically driving a truck with three wheels. You can't make sense of a water-oil ratio unless you have the oil part of the ratio. And so we always show for every producing well, not just the water wells, the oil and gas wells, what's happening. Have to have that. We don't make you buy it from a third party service and add them together yourself. It's already fully integrated into the system. So if you're interested in water intelligence and water ratios, you can use source water and you don't have to also pay for drilling info, right? Or environments, or whatever we call it. Satellite analytics. So this is the area where we've really been pioneering upstream market intelligence. And uh, we were featured in the journal Petroleum Technology in this story. It sounded like Chicago Permian was about us last December. We just had a nice front page story in the Houston Chronicle just a few weeks ago about the Permian space race, that uh, we're apparently in the lead in the Permian space race. And so here's what we're doing. Here's how this came about. Back in our marketplace days, about three years ago, we were always going out to Midland, driving around Permian, and we'd see these frack water pits. And a lot of times you'd see a sign by the side of the road that say water for sale all this number. So of course we're in the business of helping people sell water, so we call that number. And you always get a guy who would say, I can sell my water on the internet, that's great, sign me up. So we said, these people love us. How do we find all the people who have frack water pits so we can sign them up for our system? Turns out, in the great state of Texas, if you want to dig a ditch on your property, drill a few water wells and fill that ditch with water, God bless you. That's up to you. That's your right as a landowner. There are no public records about where the frack pits are, who owns them, how much is in them, what kind of water it is. Absolutely nothing. Well, this is a little frustrating for us because we want to find old frack pits. Turns out no one knew where they were. 
So we have the idea, you know, there's this whole new kind of commercial satellite business out there. Can we look at pictures from space and see squares of water in a desert? Yeah, it turns out you can do that pretty reliably. And so once we started doing that, and creating a system that tracks all the frag pits and starts to assess their size and volume and water quality, we would tie that to the databases of the surface owner records and the drilling permits and figure out who are these pits supplying, who owns them, let's talk to them. And then we started to realize that actually there's a lot of things you can see happening on the ground in the oil field that either never show up in permit records ever, like the frag pits, or that have such a long lag you know, 3, 6, 12, 15 months, that you might as well not be able to see them. So what else can we see on the ground that makes a difference besides frack ponds? And frack ponds are great because not only do we want to know where the water is, but actually every frack needs a pond. So if we see those ponds getting built and filling up, we're able to predict where the hydraulic fracturing is going to happen way before the permits ever get filed. Likewise, we've realized we can look at the well pads getting built on the ground because before a rig ever goes and starts drilling a well, they have to clear a pad, make a nice level square, square area to put all that equipment. And in Texas, those pads usually get built anywhere between two and six months before the drilling permit is ever filed. The drilling permits usually get filed right around the same time that the rig shows up to the site. It's like, it only takes you a day to get that drilling permit, maybe a week. Sometimes they get filed afterwards, actually. But you have to build the pad. And so really what we're doing is we're predicting rig locations of drilling activity up to six months before the permits do. And so if your business is around getting ahead of the rig and getting ahead of the permit, and you're just relying on downloading drilling permits or tracking the rigs on certain other oil field intelligence services, you're way behind. In fact, the permits on average are filed 16 days after the well was already spudded. Now, that doesn't mean you always file like that, but a lot of times they do come after the well is flooded, and so you're actually already behind. Wondering how the other guys got the deal before you again and again and again? It's because you're chasing the rig, chasing, chasing the permits. Here's a map of all the Permian Basin rack pits from a few months ago. We are the only source in the world for the locations of Permian Basin rack pits. This map does not exist anywhere else except from our satellite imagery analysis. And here's an example of the value of looking at the well pads as they get developed and not waiting for the permits to come out. What you're looking at here is Reeves County, a month by month snapshot going about 24 months into the past, ending in the middle of 2018. The red dots you're seeing are when we detected a new well pad. The green dots are when a drilling permit showed up within 500 meters of a well pad that was detected. And what you can see if you analyze this is, there's about a six month lag time between when the new well pad gets built and the drilling permit shows up somewhere close to that well pad. So we're predicting where new drilling is going to go six months before the drilling permits come out of drilling info, wherever it is you're getting permits from. Another area of new intelligence that we're pioneering and actually, let me say about the satellite imagery analysis, I should mention. These systems are patented, I gotta tell you, they're patented. And we actually have four US patents granted on the, not just pending, but granted on the use of satellite imagery to identify and analyze energy infrastructure. And we've got a lot more in process. So we were kind of amazed to discover that we're basically, it was a green field type of thing, we were the first people looking at them. Mobile sensors, I mentioned before that we're incorporating the well site navigator, very popular navigation app. It's been purchased more than 50,000 times by oil field workers. It has more than 20,000 active users. And we're able to incorporate that location tracking into understanding what's happening in the oil field supply chain, the upstream supply chain. In effect, we're able to do real-time mapping of the oil field supply chain. This is something we're in development on now, bringing it together. And we're going to be able to bring out new kinds of intelligence products like current waiting times right now. It's all water disposals that have trucks backed up. Where's the congestion? Which routes are more efficient than others? We're going to be able to map all of the private lease roads, which is where most of the driving happens, not all the interstates. We're going to be able to measure that impact on infrastructure and map where the activity is happening, not 15 months ago, but today, right now. 
We're also investing in advanced geoscience development, mapping all those 47 disposal formations and the producing formations to understand where the water is gonna come from and where the water can go. Because in the future growth of this industry, of saltwater disposal, the trade-offs between drilling costs and approval risk under application and risks of seismicity combined with that smart placement of where can I put this disposal or run this water pipeline to ensure that it's always going to be full all the time, you're, need to, you're going to need to consider all of those factors in making those big investment decisions, especially if you're going to be drilling, say, a Devonian saltwater disposal in New Mexico and spending $20 million to build that saltwater disposal well. You better be real, real confident that you're putting it in the right place and the right depth and that it's going to be full of water and it's really going to work. And so we're helping our clients make better decisions, not just about where to put their water infrastructure, those pipelines and disposals and pits on the ground, but where they should put them on the ground. Uh, and now what I want to conclude with is tell you about a few of our new product releases that have never been described publicly before. And I know that's why you've been sitting here waiting, not because you think you might win with the Apple Watch. <laughs> this is the part you've really been waiting for, not the watch. So uh, I'm going to talk about three new areas where we've got new products coming out that are available now. Um, and these have never been announced publicly before. So uh, I didn't hear the drum roll, but I'm sure it's somewhere out there the drummer is coming in. So the first one I want to talk about is legal lotus alerts. This is really cool. It's been getting a lot of interest, and it sounds so simple, and yet it is so valuable. So a lot of people don't realize that in Texas and in New Mexico, before you can file a drilling permit for a new saltwater disposal or injection well, you have to publish a notice in paper that looks like this. You have to publish a notice in a nearby local newspaper. It turns out there's almost 700 local newspapers in Texas and New Mexico. And one thing I can tell you for sure, when somebody is publishing this notice about where their saltwater disposal is going to go in one of these newspapers, they are always going to choose the smallest newspaper that has the fewest readers. <laughs> because you really don't want anybody to see that notice. Why? Because the reason for the notice is to give an opportunity to your competitors and other operators in the area to protest your disposal permit. That's why it's a public notice. And so operators want to know that you might be injecting water near their producing wells that could potentially interfere with their producing wells in some way. And other disposal companies want to know that you're going there and want to protest it to protect their market position and prevent you from adding competing capacity near their existing disposal wells. And so it turns out that if you're a bigger operator or disposal company, you may well have one or more people who do nothing all day except read the, you know, Pecos Times Gazette for whatever, you know, whatever the local newspaper is that nobody's ever heard of that comes out, you know, maybe once a week on a couple of pages. And so one of the other things about these disposal notices is they're written in a way that it's not very easy to figure out where that disposal well is. And I know this text is a little small, but it doesn't give you a latitude and longitude for where the well is. It says that, you know, for example, it's, what's this one here? Uh, you know, 21.5 miles northeast of Fort Stanton in a particular county, in a particular oil field, whatever that means. But it doesn't give you a dot on the map. What we do is, we ingest all of this information from all 691 newspapers every single day. And every single day, we plot where that disposal well is or could be on a map. And we then allow you to set up area of interest alerts so that if any new disposal or injection permit is, or public notice is published in your area of interest where you might want to protest it or know that your competitor is getting aggressive, or know that some other operator might be injecting water that's going to interfere with your producing wells, you're able to get that alert every single day and never miss a thing, and not have, have a bunch of people who do nothing all day but read those 691 local newspapers. This is a completely new product, it's patent pending, and there is 
no existing product in the world that does this. So if you're in the business of knowing where salt water disposal and injection wells are going to go and you need to know this, please get in touch with us and we'll give you a demonstration and show you what it's able to do. The second new intelligence product that I want to tell you about today is true depths and formations. So this is a really important aspect of geoscience insights that we're developing as we study the subsurface and better characterize what's happening with salt water injection and disposal under the surface. As I like to say, for the last 150 years, geologists have been studying the subsurface to figure out where the oil is and how to get it out. But until now, nobody was really studying the subsurface to figure out where the salt water that comes up with the oil can be put back down. That's actually a really new thing. Nobody cared that much until now. And so what we do is, and again, this is information that's not available from any other surface anywhere. We actually look at the entire history of every well bore for this injection disposal. And we look at that whole history and figure out exactly where is that water being injected in the subsurface. Now, you might think, oh, is that on the drilling permit? No, it is not. When someone files for a drilling permit for disposal or injection well, they're going to a lot of effort to file that drilling permit. They're going to spend a lot of money on it. So they always ask for the biggest interval they can possibly ask for in that disposal or injection well. But that doesn't mean that they're going to inject the water into that entire you know, 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 foot interval. They're only actually going to perforate in a few small areas of that well, probably, for cost reasons. And so they're only really ejecting the water into a small area. There's a huge difference between the permanent interval and the active or true injection or disposal interval. And that becomes really, really important for a bunch of reasons. One is, if you're evaluating buying a disposal well, or you own a disposal well, you're making a very bad decision if you're taking the permitted interval that you're finding on the permit that the person selling it shows you and assuming that you're going to be able to inject water at the permitted injection rate of pressure on that whole interval, however many thousand feet that is. You just got hosed because you can only actually inject water into the small area that's actually perforated where you can inject that water at a much smaller portion of that total well. So if you are buying or selling a disposal well, you have to know this. And what this chart shows you on the board is that if you were just to use the permanent intervals and not the true intervals for valuing disposal wells, you'd actually be off by billions of dollars in disposal value across the Permian Basin. The other reason is, if you're planning to drill a new disposal or injection well, you need to know what the real pressure and volume capacity is in the actual formations that you're going to be injecting into. And you can only know that by working backward from the existing disposal and injection wells in your area, and where are they really injecting, and what pressures are they registering in those formations. And so you have to know the true intervals to assess that when you plan the new disposal. You can't just assume that your disposal is going to perform injecting into a few hundred feet the same way as an existing disposal that's injecting supposedly in 5,000 feet next door, because they're not really injecting at 5,000 feet. You need to know exactly where they're injecting. And so this is a crucial tool in understanding exactly how much water has been going where, both for acquiring disposals and for planning and drilling new disposals. The last new capability we're going to talk about is our project planning and area of interest tools. This is something we've been getting asked for for a long time. It's not a huge technology breakthrough but it is a big, big help to our users and people who are thinking about using our system. Because of course, we have all of these layers and layers of data on our system. All the oil and gas and water and disposal wells, all the surface owner information. All of this information about seismicity and pressures and volumes and all the flows. But for your project, you need to lay out your project on that map and see how it relates to all of these parcel owners, mineral owners, and injection wells, and operators, and where's the water coming from, and to, and where are the pits, and where are the disposals, and where are the pipelines. Well, we now have project planning tools that let you create and lay out your project, overlaid on all of this intelligence, all these different layers that I've been telling you about today, and then save that project, 
be able to share it with your colleagues inside or outside of your company, and be able to work on it and edit and collaborate on it together. A lot of people today use Google Earth for that, but Google Earth isn't designed for the oil and gas industry, and the satellite imagery that you're seeing in Google Earth is typically anywhere from a year to several years out of date, whereas the satellite imagery that we're showing you is from the last five days. And so it's much more accurate in the fast-changing, permeate-based oil field world that there's new paths and pits being built all the time. And we keep track of that and allow you to design your projects on top of it, and then including such a show where all the surface owners are, who you're passing through, where you need those right ways or where they exist. And then we're able to give you alerts when something of interest happens in that area where you're planning your project uh, or where you have intentions. So this screen is showing you how you fill out a form within the system that allows you to specify all the things within an area that could happen that you want to know as soon as they happen. For example, my competitor is starting to construct new well pads in an offsetting lease to mine. My offset operator is constructing new pads. I want to know that right away because it, when they start drilling there, it could cause frack hits for me. Or I just want to get ahead of them in my operations before they tap into that reservoir that I'm planning on also. I don't want to wait and have somebody drive by and then let me know, hey boss, looks like something's going on over there. I think I see a rig. We're going to tell you that we're starting to construct those pads months before the firms or the rigs show up, and you don't have to check every day. You can set up an area of interest alert in the source water system. And as soon as construction starts happening in that five-day cadence satellite imagery, we will send you that alert or because a new public notice was filed for a new disposal, we're going to send you that alert as soon as it comes out so that you don't miss anything and make a big mistake when you plan or invest in these enormous investments. So in conclusion, what I've tried to show today is that those big questions that I brought up at the beginning of the presentation, we spent a long time together, thanks for everybody staying, can be answered using the source water intelligence Yes, you can see where every drop of produced water is, was, and will be on the surface and in the subsurface. Yes, you can see where new drilling and locations and disposals will go in the future using our satellite imagery and our legal notice systems on the surface and below the surface. And you can see exactly where to put new water infrastructure on the surface where you're going to maximize those returns, maximize that efficiency, get the best return on investment keep those pipes and disposals and pits full, and where to put them under the surface to get the best capacity and pressure utilization for that disposal well which you're landing underground. And so um, with that, we have a couple of minutes for questions.